thanks to others also who vlogged in online for this very important session. Uh, my name is Mona Anand. I work for the Coalition for Disaster Resilient Infrastructure. This is a global coalition. Um, it's an international organization that's committed to promoting resilience of existing and new infrastructure globally. Um, it is my honor to be moderating this session uh, that is being co-organized by WMO and CDRI in a true spirit of partnership. Um, the title of the session, as you know, is Pathways to Climate and Disaster Resilient Energy Transition. The session seeks to explore the pathways to a cleaner future that is also resilient to disaster and climate shocks and stresses. We have an August panel with us today. They are colleagues and friends, and I'm very pleased to be working with them on this session. Um, at the far end of the stage is uh, Roberta Boscolo. She leads the climate and energy work at the WMO, uh, and she has a demonstrated passion for climate science, for low carbon, and affordable energy for all. She has wide and deep knowledge of climate and sustainability related issues, and she works at the interface between climate science and socioeconomic sectors, mainly energy. And I'm proud to share with you that she was also included in the list of top 10 sustainability influencers by the Sustainability Magazine. Welcome, Roberta. Um, next uh, to her right is Meredith Evans. She's an energy policy and finance expert with over 20 years of experience, international experience. She holds a joint appointment with the University of Maryland Center for Global Sustainability. And she's also a team lead uh, and senior scientist at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, where she manages a program on developing decision-relevant science for sustainable energy. Welcome, Meredith. Next, I want to move to the only gentleman on this panel. <laughs> Mr. Wang Wei is the director of the Division of Planning, Information, and Knowledge Management at the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA. Since joining the agency in 2016, Wang Wei has led the capacity building work for energy planning, information, and knowledge management for supporting the member states of the agency to develop science-based climate and energy policy. Very welcome, Wang Wei. And finally, the lady right in the middle, uh, Jin Sun Lee. She leads the work of the International Energy Agency on Climate Resilience for Energy Security. She's working on assessing climate risks and impacts on energy systems, identifying resilience measures, and developing policy recommendations for decision makers. Prior to joining the IEA, she's been doing something very, very interesting. She was the climate negotiator for the Republic of Korea. So this is indeed a very august panel, and I'm very pleased to be working with you. Before we move forward as the co-moderator and co-organizer, Roberta, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, so welcome everybody to this side event. I'm really um, honored to be uh, co-hosting this uh, side event together with uh, the Coalition on Disaster Resilience Infrastructure. Um, this um, discussion, this narrative is really new, but I feel like we have done so much and achieved so much so far. At least we have a, a path, a path um, on the future activities, some actions that we want to produce, to propose today and uh, um, I look forward to this discussion also together. I hope you can have an interaction during this event. Thank you, Roberta. So now to set the ball rolling really, and I think I'm talking to the converted here, but just a few facts for us to recall and remember as we move forward in this conversation. The first one that I want to put on the table for us is the alarming need to invest in resilience of infrastructure in the future. Uh, there's sufficient data that's available. We all have access to it. And I have some numbers to you know, bring to you. 80 trillion US dollars to be invested in infrastructure in the next 15 years, 80 trillion. 
and we are losing 18 billion every year only to disasters right so it's it's like a ship with with some holes it doesn't matter how much no it's not a ship with, it's a bottomless pit really you know we we keep putting it and we keep losing it second energy is set to be the largest share of this investment that's required and this is predominantly in the low and medium income countries um, that are suffering energy deficiency. The global north that already has in a, uh, infrastructure, perhaps adequate infrastructure, is suffering aging of the infrastructure and stranded assets that are existing. And um, if I just take the case of power, the infrastructure systems that we have for power are normally designed for high frequency, low impact events. Low frequency, high impact events are normally not considered. So that's something that we need to take cognizance of. And then climate change has thrown a curved ball at us. You know, it's, it's changing the game altogether. There's a new context to the design of the system itself. And new technologies and solutions are required for us to be future ready if we have to move towards a low carbon future. So if I may request you, Som, to please show us the first set of slides, the zero deck. Yes, thank you. I wanted to bring some humor into the room. Uh, can we move forward? I'm not sure whether this is working. Yeah, move forward, please. Yeah. Take a close look. We cannot afford to make mistakes anymore, really. And we better be sure of the consequences of each decision that we are taking. Next, please. And we cannot afford the luxury of trial and error and not to have a defined path for the future. Next, please. And we have to move from information that we all have adequate access to already. How do we move from information to knowledge? Already we are beginning, you know, as, as a community of professionals together on this panel, we've been looking at what does this information mean in terms of knowledge? How do we move from knowledge to wisdom? That's really what we are trying to explore here through this conversation. Um, now to get us into the subject itself, deep dive, I first invite Jin Sun. She will be talking to us about the state of play with regard to energy, energy transition. And of course, she'll be drawing from the recently launched flagship report. That I think you launched it yesterday, isn't it? Over to you, Jinsun. Thank you very much, Mona. So I would like to introduce uh, IEA's work on the climate resilience for energy security. So we have assessed the different type of climate change impacts on the different segments of the energy systems. Um, next slide, please. So um, IA has started working on this topic about like a, a few years ago, and we decided to work on a very specific themes, for example, like climate impacts on African hydropower, Latin American hydropower, or South Southeast Asian hydropower to raise awareness and to motivate the people to pay more attention on this topic because hydropower is one of the areas which is the most vulnerable to the climate change, which is the most affected by the climate change impacts as well. And then we broaden the scope to the electricity system entirely. So we have published climate resilience uh, report. And also we focused on the policy, what kind of policies are currently ready for the climate resilience enhancement. So we developed the climate resilience policy indicator, which is all available on our website. And yesterday, as Mona mentioned, we have published climate resilience for energy security. So this one, we have broadened the scope to the energy demand and also the fuels and resources, particularly critical minerals, which has been, uh, which are uh, one of the core parts for the clean energy transition for the EV, wind power plants, and batteries. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the uh, interesting findings I would like to share with you is about the, uh, there will be really different pathways between the low emission scenario and high emission scenarios. As you can see, the check marks are showing the climate impacts on each part of the energy system, even under the low emission scenario. So these are very likely to happen, although we try to abate our emissions. 
but there are exclamation marks which shows that which, which we can avoid this kind of impacts if we, if we address the climate change, uh, uh, climate change impacts on time and limit uh, our global warming below two degree scenarios. So you can see that currently we are already facing some of the uh, difficulties related to the high speed wind such as tropical cyclones and wildfires and precipitation, heavy rainfall. Those are very likely to happen and likely to have a, a broader uh, impacts on the uh, energy systems. But you can see that we can avoid some of the uh, adverse impacts of the climate change from temperature and the droughts, uh, more drier climate with the precipitation decrease and also sea level rise. Next slide, please. So uh, as you can see, uh, for each segment of the power systems and also the electricity grid, you can see a little bit positive picture right now about the green and yellow dots only in terms of the climate change risk. But could you click? Uh, thank you. And now, if we are going to the high emission scenario, it's during the same period for the 2080 to 2100, you can see there are many red dots, particularly related to precipitation and also the temperature. So you can see, for example, heat waves can have a very negative impacts on the uh, thermal power plants from gas and nuclear, and also the uh, solar PV and uh, electricity grids as well. And also the uh, heavy rainfall and floods can have also negative impacts on uh, a pretty large part of the electricity systems as well. And it is also similar uh, picture overview for the fuels and uh, minerals. So you can see the refineries, coal mines, and nickel mining, uh, cobalt, uh, lithium, and copper. Uh, those are having, how can I say, manageable level of the risk if we abate uh, greenhouse gas emissions below the two degree scenario. Could you? But as you can see, also there are more red dots and orange dots for the mining sector, or and also refineries and coal mines. So which means that usually those kind of mining sectors, they are very sensitive to the water availability and uh, uh, because they require a lot of water, but m many of them are concentrated in a small number of countries and those countries are very vulnerable to the changes in the droughts and also changes in the floods and heavy precipitations. Next slide, please. Yeah, um, so this is uh, just to provide an overview. So if you want to take a look at a little bit more detailed uh, picture about the, uh, what kind of thing would happen, uh, not only about in terms of the electricity and also fuel supply, but also on the demand, please visit our website and check the climate resilience for energy security. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jinsun. That I think very clearly highlighted how, you know, regardless of our stand on emissions, the impact of disasters and climate shocks on infrastructure are, are going to worsen and we better do something about it. I now move to Roberta uh, with a request for you to provide some reflections on the pathway from a climate science perspective and also a bit of sharing of your work at the WMO, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mona. Um, so I, uh, first slide, uh, sec second one, please. Um, is, uh, is about really the starting point of uh, our raising awareness for uh, uh, and, um, uh, and pushing for action for uh, disaster uh, to, to increase the resilience of the energy sector. And this is a, um, a report that WMO does every, uh, release every year, and it is the state of uh, the global climate. We had this, this one is in 2021, and uh, we had a preliminary one also for 2022, just uh, uh, announced uh, at the beginning of uh, this event at the COP. And we can see that the key messages uh, are basically uh, on the indicators of the climate uh, uh, change. We continue to have uh, an increase on the temperature uh, and uh, due to the increase of the concentration of greenhouse gases uh, in the atmosphere, uh, and uh, this is causing uh, uh, sea level rise, uh, which is uh, already uh, reached the uh, uh, high record uh, value, and uh, uh, belting of the glacial and uh, uh, heat waves, uh, and all sorts of impacts on the infrastructure, uh, especially uh, as well. So, 
This is what WMO does to really raise awareness uh, uh, on the way that climate is changing and is impacting, and is impacting all, this, all the sector of uh, our socioeconomic structure and pattern. Um, but this is not the kind of information, say, that we uh, would use to actually uh, develop uh, resilience pathways. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in order to do for decision making, really for, the, for uh, climate action, we need to have highly uh, localized data, highly temperature resolution data, and, uh, um, and specific for specific location, for the specific hazards. And the way that we see uh, uh, the science guiding this climate action is through what we call it the climate services. And this is uh, uh, part of the theory of change of WMO. We need to start with uh, the real um, problem that we want to, 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 to solve. Uh, the, the needs of, uh, of uh, our users and uh, we can start uh, interacting with all the stakeholders in a kind of a cycle uh, where this interaction will help us to identify which data we need, um, how to communicate, what is the kind of a knowledge that is needed to take action and, uh, uh, and also this is really all the steps that concludes with uh, a new evaluation if the actual action that we took is effective and if not, why, and uh, how to improve. So we are going to release soon a new um, uh, report. It's called Integrated Weather and Climate Services to Support of the Net Zero uh, Transition. And uh, these are all best practices on how to uh, access the data, which kind of data we need, and what kind of uh, co-design and co-production of this product is needed to take place uh, to um, re really uh, close the gap between the knowledge and the climate action. Uh, so when, uh, as I said, the choices depend, of course, not only from the uh, climate uh, knowledge and climate information, but also, you know, from, uh, uh, it depends also on the cost to prepare, the cost to respond, the cost to recover, and the capital availability directly and indirectly. And as the climate change, also these parameter change. So this cycle really has to happen at least every year to uh, be updated and uh, to guide uh, uh, the uh, most effective and most efficient uh, climate action. Next one. So uh, because not everyone uh, has the same information or they interpret it the same way, uh, the capacity development and capacity building is a key to uh, really um, provide this knowledge everywhere and to everyone. Uh, WMO uh, also collaborated with the Green Climate Fund to develop uh, this uh, uh, report uh, that uh, um, is uh, you know, new climate information and tools to guide uh, the development uh, uh, of analytics for action. Um, and this methodology uh, also is based on specific tool. Uh, one is the, the, climate, uh, the information, uh, climate information platform and also another uh, tool that is called CLIMPACT and is a statistical tool for calculating uh, context uh, specific climate indicators and high impact event indicators. Uh, and I would like to just go to one specific example that really happened this year and we are also uh, part of this uh, um, um, project. Uh, next one please. And it is, uh, so what happened in Malawi in the beginning of uh, January was uh, a tropical storm, Anna, that hit the power station uh, in, uh, in Malawi and basically uh, damaged the uh, hydropower and they had to close the I infrastructure. So they lost uh, 130 megawatts of uh, electricity in a country that already has 80% of population that doesn't have access uh, to electricity. 
Um, now we are uh, with another project, with this project called Focus Africa, which is funded by the European Union. We are working with the EDF, uh, who is going to build a new uh, hydropower uh, uh, with uh, 300, more than 300 uh, mega, megawatts. Next, next one, please. And uh, together with uh, the Met Service in Malawi, the Department of, of Climate Change uh, and uh, Meteorology, we are providing information on the specific uh, parameter needed to build uh, the new hydropower which withstands uh, storms like Anna to happen and destroy again in the future. So we are looking at a scenario, the same, the same uh, uh, methodology that also uh, um, the IEA has been describing in their reports. Um, next one, please. So just a publicity, we also uh, recently, um, WMO launched the state of the climate service in energy with many key issues to take into consideration when it goes about energy security and energy resilience. Uh, I don't have much uh, um, uh, time to go through, but I just want to say that when we talk about climate resilience and the cost of climate resilience, we need also to consider the climate information that needs to underpin this climate resilience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roberta. If there are any burning questions, clarifications, we can take them now. We move forward? OK. I will then invite uh, Wang Wei. And we want to hear from you what is your perspective from the Atomic Energy Agency side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, let me thank you, uh, uh, WMO, inviting IEA to, to this uh, very uh, important panel. Uh, we are also very glad to host the yesterday event to, uh, for this IEA report of, on the resilient uh, uh, topic. I think that showed how international organizations cooperate each other to address the global issues. So I think so you all know that AR, AR, uh, IPCC uh, AR6 report already re reflected the frequency and intensity of the, uh, caused by the climate change to the, all the system and the energy system itself cannot be immune from that one. So when we try to uh, address this uh, uh, carbon emission, try to burn the curve of emission and make sure that 1.5 degree uh, target can be uh, still within the reach. The energy system itself should be resilient, robust to survive in this uh, climate uh, environment, extreme environments. So that the diversity of the energy system is very important because uh, when we move on this uh, clean energy transition, we are looking at more uh, shares of the renewable and that is most of them actually very much uh, climate re uh, reliance because you, what uh, Jensen mentioned that the hydropower has a lot of impact by the climate change with the water issue, the, the drought, and other systems including nuclear is not ex uh, excluded from this uh, impact. But we want to say that each uh, energy system should play their part to improve their resilience to make sure the whole system can be strong to adapt this uh, uh, extreme uh, environment. So that is one uh, point I want to share. The second, when I talk about uh, the, the individual uh, technology, because I come from nuclear, so that's why I would like to show some information about the C. You can see that this uh, picture, uh, this sh uh, chart, give you some uh, overview about where the current nuclear reactor located. So most of, uh, you see, they are still relying on the water to ensure the, uh, the cooling, uh, because the current design is just like this, so you can see uh, depends the location, they have a different impact from this uh, climate change uh, environment. And uh, in the, the IEA report, they already show that we are, have more impact because from this uh, temp high temperature on the water issue, and also wind to, to somehow to some uh, reactors. But from the overview, a general uh, perspective, if we talk about nuclear, because nuclear is very special sector, comparing to other uh, energy systems because this is a heavily regulated air sector. So from the very beginning when we select the nuclear site, this external uh, environment uh, has been given a fully comprehensive assessment. So, so that's why there's quite a confidence that is the nuclear can re uh, resist this uh, uh, external events. But unfortunately, we have a one 
accident happened just uh, more than uh, 10 years ago at the Fukushima, because that is also caused by the external uh, tsunami caused this failure. So that is a good lessons learned for the nuclear industry, how we can look at it, because in the, his, in the past, we look at only the historic record of the meteorological uh, record about the sighting. But uh, given we have the, now we have to take into account uh, the future in the context of global climate change, because that can cause some difference in different situation which has been not been taken into account when we uh, uh, deploy the nuclear reactors to strengthen this uh, clean, uh, low carbon transition. So that's the, what we are doing. Can I go to the next? Yeah, this is just some uh, information which is similar to what the Jensen already mentioned, that's how the climate uh, uh, external events can have the impact on the nuclear. I will not go to detail, but you can see different area can have a different impact uh, at coastline and the water or lake probably the lakeside uh, nuclear reactor can have a more impact from this climate change. Coastline is uh, relatively uh, resilient because now this issue, uh, a tsunami and sea level rise has been taken into account. So the new uh, power system has uh, been further strengthened so can uh, adapt to this environmental, cha uh, ish, uh, environmental change. Can I go to the next one? So we as an agency, we conduct a lot of uh, studies to uh, assess the resilience of nuclear energy. Uh, you can see the, the reports uh, in the past and also the recent report in uh, last year and also this year we just released. In, in one of the uh, reports we released this year uh, when we talk about climate change and nuclear power, there is a chapter talking about the resilience to show how much the Im uh, impact can cost to the nuclear power. We have a bad news that is uh, in, the past uh, in the past decades uh, we, uh, nuclear power received some kind of uh, impact and caused some kind of frequent uh, 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 <coughs> a, a very frequency on the, the capacity. But the good news is that if we cut a total uh, 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 economic uh, no, uh, generation loss is still very tri uh, tiny. I have given you data that in the past decades, in total, we the global uh, wise, uh, the nuclear power can only uh, last like uh, 50 terawatt hour production. This is only count one, the 0.1 percent of total capacity of nuclear power uh, in the past decades. So that means nuclear is still quite resilient in uh, in terms of the uh, the external uh, events and also the weather uh, impact. So uh, in order to further strengthen uh, the nuclear uh, resilience agency. Can we move to the next one? Uh, recently start a new uh, initiative uh, focus on uh, how we can further strengthen the nuclear uh, system co in cooperation with our member states. A lot of issue has been taken care of from uh, all these aspects from the parameters of the, uh, the sea level rise and the frequency of the external uh, events and also uh, some other factors. And then we also go to the uh, detail how to uh, improve ourselves. We have to look at uh, all the elements, including the siting, including the safety margin for the nuclear system, and also how to implement uh, a stress test. You know, after Fukushima, uh, global-wise, there is a, a global-wise stre safety stress, uh, a stress test to, to assess the, uh, the situ situation and to see what is the weakness. Uh, then action has been taken uh, in all countries who are uh, running nu uh, operating nuclear power plants. So the global wise now, the safety uh, system has been further strengthened. Uh, nuclear become more robust, robust more resilient. Uh, we, we are co quite confident nuclear can contribute to this uh, uh, global uh, uh, climate change uh, comeback. Uh, we as kind of a low carbon energy system can also can complement the uh, increasing the penetration of renewable in the net zero pathway. Thank you very much. Thank you. Indeed, very interesting. And I think the, the cross-cutting message from the three presentations so far is that the past is no longer a good guide for the future. We have to reinvent the entire system altogether. We cannot rely on the past. So now we turn to Meredith, researcher, practitioner. What do you want us to remember? Over to you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of you for coming here this morning to um, discuss and engage around this incredibly important topic. How do we make sure 
our energy systems are both resilient and decarbonized. Um, I'd like to hit on three key points today. The first is the what. What kind of impacts can we potentially envisage, particularly when we look at climate impacts, not only in isolation, but also in the context of our developing planet. Next, I'd like to talk about a couple of technologies that can help in adapting. And finally, I'd like to talk about how we can use advanced modeling, um, anal data analytics, to understand what kind of technology options and planning options we have to improve our resilience, which is incredibly important, as you've also heard from the other speakers. So in terms of the impacts, I, I really appreciate the insights of the other panelists in terms of the kinds of impacts. One additional point I'd like to bring in is this idea that we live in an integrated planet, that we can't just look at the climate impacts in isolation. So, for example, if we, sorry, sorry about that. Hopefully that's better on your ears. Um, if we look at the impacts such as increasing heat and heat waves, which we know can have climate impacts in terms of sparking wildfires, or, um, but also if you think about our development pathways, as we expand our access to cooling and to more comfortable living spaces, obviously that is going to increase power system demand at the same time that um, we may have reduced um, ability to provide electricity to meet those demands. And in addition, another example is with um, water systems. So clearly we need water to run our energy systems well, both for hydropower and for cooling. Um, cooling uh, is definitely impacted by heat waves. And at the same time, that same water is impacted by our other demands. And we know over time, those demands are really driving what is happening hydrologically in the planet as we need more water for agriculture, for urban use, and so on. So understanding that integrated perspective is incredibly important in meeting the climate challenge um, and the challenge of climate impacts. Um, likewise, increasing precipitation, as we've heard from other speakers, can have a huge impact. And also on where we develop. So the human influence is where do we site our infrastructure? Can we think about that as we are, um, as we're planning out that infrastructure? Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, and other impacts include, for example, the tropical cyclones we've heard about and so on. Moving on to a few technology examples. Um, so next slide, please. I wanted to mention some work that our national lab, as well as, as, well as other national laboratories, has been involved in, uh, helping Puerto Rico recover after Hurricane Maria, and thinking through more um, resilient energy systems, including decentralized renewables and energy storage. Um, so our lab is helping to provide modeling that will allow, allow um, Puerto Rico to develop more resilient systems and understanding the implications of renewables for the rollout of their um, renovated grid. Next slide, please. And then a couple of other um, more uh, ad advanced technologies as we try to decarbonize the planet. We actually can use some of those decarbonization technologies to help us become more resilient writ large. So for example, carbon dioxide removal, um, countries can earn money from that through carbon trading. And that can help them have money to improve their resilience. Also, uh, biochar, which is a technology to use uh, agricultural waste and convert it into an enhancement for the soil that actually increases uh, soil um, uh, water retention as well as productivity. And so it can help in um, making the land healthier, making the land more resilient, and also making the land more, um, help, help in res uh, resisting other types of climate impacts, such as extreme uh, rain events. And a third one is desalinization paired with seawater carbon capture, which can reduce the strain on surface and groundwater 
uh, resources in arid regions such as uh, Egypt. So those t same types of water resources are also critical for our energy systems. Desalination is a relatively energy intensive uh, operation, but it's increasingly needed in many countries where water is in extremely short supply. Uh, seawater actually contains more carbon dioxide than the air, and it can provide an interesting and helpful way to more cost effectively capture and store uh, carbon uh, from various planetary systems. Next slide. So finally, I'd like to talk about models and data to inform planning for climate impacts. Um, and this is work we have collaborated with other institutions, other national labs and governments, both in the United States and other countries, including India, uh, South America, and, and so on. Um, so understanding the climate projection data, there, there are, of course, challenges in terms of model variability and uncertainty, the spatio-temporal scale and accessibility. Um, colleagues of mine are working on an innovative approach called STITCHES that brings together uh, the latest output of Earth system models and stitches it together in new ways to understand um, extreme events in different locations around the world based on um, uh, machine learning and probabilistic assumptions. Uh, modeling the climate impacts ultimately requires si models that look at uh, climate systems, power systems, and also multi-sector models to understand this uh, interplay between systems such as you know, how you're using your water or what is happening with your demand on your power grid. Could you use electric vehicles as backup storage to improve the stability of the grid and so on? And obviously none of us knows with exact certainty what the future will look like in any one point. So scenario analysis is really important to decision making. Integrated modeling can be a game changer in planning. So en enhancing collaboration between modelers and stakeholders so that they're speaking the same language, um, developing uh, more application relevant science to inform decision making, and also building capacity around those um, types of data and, and information to just improve our ability to uh, integrate science and, and respond to our changing climate. So with that, um, I would like to thank you and really happy to uh, engage in the discussion. Thank you. Right. So um, if I were to summarize one takeaway from you, Meredith, what resonated very well with me was this whole idea of the integrated approach. You started with the integrated planet you know, our, how we cohabit the planet together, and then the interdependency between water and energy, you know, the, the nexus that you talked about. And then you also mentioned about integrated modeling. So, you know, that to me is, is a cross-cutting uh, perspective that you've brought. And uh, you also talked about cohesive stakeholder behavior so that, you know, decision-making is, is more harmonious and is geared towards the same target. So thank you very much for that. With that, I think we can move into some discussion. And I have some questions for our panelists, but we are happy to take additional questions from all of you sitting in the room. Um, maybe we'll begin with you, Wang Wei, if you're OK with that. Um, I think it'll be good for us to learn from you. It'll be good for us to learn from you. Where do you see all the enablers? This is an action-oriented COP. We want to move away from the rhetoric and uh, move to action. So to, for us to move forward, we need some enablers, some favorable conditions. So where do you see the enablers located? Thank, thank you very much. This is a very uh, fair question. I think the uh, in, enabling environment is very, very important. And that is to make, come from the, the policy, policy making process. Because when we try to facilitate, uh, accelerate this uh, transition, so we need that clear policy. Because addressing uh, climate change to ensure the resilience, to ensure the uh, mitigation target can be achieved, this is not short-term target. You need this is a long-term commitment. So that's why we need uh, clear policy from a different level, from international uh, member states, from parties, or international government uh, organizations. 
uh, all stakers do have to, to fully involve that part, the process, make sure that this uh, making process, policy making process is a science-based process. And so for, and also need to every available tools and sources, uh, uh, resources on the table. But that is what we are doing now because uh, as international organization, we are not the main player, but we are facilitator to support countries with our strength and capacity. That is why we cooperate with uh, what I've been more using their data and with uh, IEA using their modeling to scale and also with our technical expertise and uh, also other uh, academic uh, sector to work together because that is the way we can uh, achieve the, the 1.5 degree target. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting that perhaps, you know, the key leverage point lies in the policy domain. And the more informed the policy is, the stronger the evidence base that's available to us, the better policy formulation can happen. The instruments can be more responsive to our needs. Uh, you also slightly touched upon the knowledge aspect, and maybe Jinsun, if I may request you to talk about that. Um, where do you see, uh, you know, organizations like yourselves and CDRI, people who are driven by knowledge, you know, playing a supportive role in leapfrogging the world into a greener, more cleaner future? Thank you. Thank you very much. I think. Um, the the knowledge gap the biggest knowledge gap exists currently is about the, how to use and how to translate the climate information and data in terms of the energy sector so there are many climate data currently open and more easily accessible by provided by WMO IPCC report and the database is working very well and many research institutes across the world they are providing such kind of data set but the issue is that even if we have a pretty good historical data and pretty good climate projection on the for example like precipitation it doesn't necessarily mean that automatically okay decreasing precipitation 10% is a 10% decrease in the hydropower no it doesn't really work like that we need to think about the land use currently and we we'll, we also need to think about the, how the stream flow will be made and groundwater availability urbanization and social impacts and etc those kind of modeling to translate those climate information to the energy sector perspective is kind of limited for now. There are many research institutes are currently working on this one, but um, I, I, I should admit that uh, the efforts is currently limited and also there are many embedded uncertainties when we are making those kind of models. So IA is currently doing such kind of modeling together with many different in, uh, international research institutes and also the international organizations to get uh, their own expertise. Um, uh, but the issue is that I think we need more uh, efforts to fill the gap and to provide a more easily accessible by the energy companies and uh, the planners in the authorities to conduct those kind of planning. Very interesting take. I mean. You talked about um, how we need to now really move from information to knowledge, and that will ultimately lead us to wisdom that we talked about earlier in the session. Uh, I will take that opportunity to share with you all another initiative that we are curating together with the WMO and IEA so far, that is on the communities of practice for energy transition. If I may request you for the slides, please. It's just a couple of slides so that, you know, I give you the key points. Yeah. So at this moment, uh, to start with the logo is CDRI because really I'm introducing CDRI here. But, you know, the idea is to bring to you the community of practice that is being seeded. So CDRI is uh, a global coalition, like I had mentioned to you. And we are all about knowledge creation facilitating inclusive stakeholder engagements that you know, push us towards resilience uh, of infrastructure. We are focused on implementation and localization of design development and maintenance of infrastructure. And the core to all of this work is inclusion, gender sensitivity, you know, social issues, all of that. So that's really what we are all about. May I have the next one, please? So this is a community of practice, and I'm so proud that uh, you know after the, the travel restrictions posed to us by COVID, we have all come together. And uh, my uh, congratulations to WMO, IEA, and my own other colleagues at CDRI who are you know who joined in virtually for the community of practice. 
And the idea here is to bring the knowledge that's available in our different you know, computer systems, in our organizations, in our own brains, to bring it together for the benefit of the world in this fashion. And the idea is to co-create new knowledge products using existing knowledge. There is already a memorandum of understanding that has been signed with WMO and a letter of intent that has been signed with IEA to take these knowledge uh, initiatives forward. And uh, when we started the session, we had one extra chair on the stage and Jinsun and I were just joking that, you know, this is the chair that needs to be filled by next COP. And Jinsun so sweetly said, we should need more chairs by the next COP. So <laughs> you're all very welcome to express your interest to join the community of practice. And some of the initial ideas that we have already emerging from our conversations are available on the next slide, please. So we are looking to work together uh, as a community to develop standards for promoting resilience of energy transition infrastructure. We are doing a landscape analysis on exactly where the gaps are which standards need to be modified and which are the new ones that need to be developed. So that's uh, where we are going to invest some time together. And then we are also committed to developing academic and professional development curricula for creating future generation of energy engineers, you know, who can take this intention forward rather than looking at past approaches and taking those forward that will perhaps not serve us very well for the future. And finally, we are looking at opportunities in the coming year to bring peers together to learn from each other, whether it's a government to government, practitioner to practitioner, um, you know, um, various academics to academics. So that kind of a peer learning exchange. Uh, Jinsun, you also talked about the involvement of the private sector. So how can private companies in different parts of the globe learn from each other and exchange their knowledge and experiences? So that's really what this community of practice is going to do, and uh, you are very welcome to write to us and uh, join the community of practice. Uh, um, I want to thank you so much. We can get we close the slides now. So I want to now move to you, Roberta. You know, when we are, you know, when I was talking of the community of practice, and uh, Wang Wei also briefly touched upon that, international cooperation has a very, very critical role starting with something as basic as data sharing, right? Going on to much larger knowledge exchange initiatives, few of those that we talked about just now. What is your perspective from the WMO side on international cooperation as a game changer for us? Yes, so I, I was really pleased to, to, to hear uh, the, uh, our uh, panelists and uh, the, the, the challenges that we all face to to have uh, you know, evidence-based uh, uh, um, uh, climate action and uh, resilience uh, uh, pathways. And so, as I said, uh, I think from the point of WMO, what we would like is to really um, create this space of, uh, of uh, discussion and uh, to, to better understand uh, the different point of view to better address uh, the integrated aspect of each of problem that we want to solve. is not one model, it's different model, it's different pathways, and uh, we need to um, uh, exchange knowledge on this, and with the best practices, I think this is a very good initiative. Uh, perhaps uh, um, start demonstration uh, projects all together, uh, and uh, um, and uh, collect all lesson learned from uh, what the way that we are doing. Demonstrate the full value chain from no, from data to knowledge to resilience and uh, evaluation and resilience afterwards. Um, so this is uh, uh, WMO would like uh, to operate at different levels, uh, global, regional and also national. Uh, and I think uh, this is the three level that we need to address uh, in order to um, close this gap of uh, knowledge and action. And uh, another key point I think that the WMO is uh, really um, uh, promoting is uh, uh, capacity development is, and is key, is important. This knowledge has to be shared with everybody because energy is uh, the, the, the key 
uh, motor for the development in all the old countries. So, um, like uh, the se director general of IEA said, you know, this is not a race among country, but it, this is a race uh, against time, and nobody wins if everybody finish the race. So I think uh, uh, the support of uh, the information provider uh, and uh, to raise the capacity in all the countries uh, to be able to support energy transition and energy resilience is, is very important and this is where WMO is uh, um, really keen to, to develop. Awesome. Thank you so much for underscoring the connection between knowledge to action. You know, we can continue to talk about things, we can continue to share, but if we don't act, like you suggested, perhaps take some collaborative pilots up uh, and also build capacities of stakeholders to take those pilots to scale based on the learning. Um, that's really what is the need of the hour. So thank you very much, Roberta, for that. I um, was wondering whether you know, we should also spend some time talking about innovations, you know, the role that innovative technologies, the new solutions that we need. How do we get to that? Because again, we are action oriented. So may I request uh, Meredith, your thoughts, please. Sure, and I think it's incredibly important to think about innovation in the context in which it's gonna be located. So think about what innovations are gonna make sense in each country where they may occur, um, and also to think about it again from this integrated perspective of what are the kinds of climate impacts when you look at different human system, how we're developing as a planet, and how that at the same time can also impact which technologies are relevant in a given place. Um, so beyond that, thinking about how to make the grid more integrated, more resilient, requires, of course, integrating renewables. It requires trying to use all the assets we have to improve grid stability, um, both our knowledge in terms of planning for climate impacts and, and other types of future changes, but also um, our ability to better integrate the grid with our buildings, with our transportation systems that can help us moderate demand at peak times and really provide very cost effectively additional resources, or as I mentioned earlier, with uh, transportation systems, where as the transportation systems likely get electrified, we suddenly have um, thousands and millions of batteries all over the planet that can help us uh, with our electricity system stability as well. Uh, now, of course, again, coming back to what is relevant in a given country. So if a, in a given country, a very large share of the population is not yet connected to power grids, then these types of in integrated solutions of in linking buildings and transport with the grid may not be the most important starting point. Microgrids may be a much better option to get started. Um, distributed renewables can be a game changer for families that want to have light at night for their, child to, for their cell phones, for their children to study. So I think thinking about it very much in the context both of where each country is and where each country is going is incredibly important. Thank you, Meredith. What um, struck me uh, just now was this, you know, how this, e you know, the subject itself straddles both adaptation and mitigation. You know, so this is, that's the huge opportunity we have when we are looking at energy transition uh, as a system and the infrastructure systems that go with that intention. So thank you very much uh, for that intervention. Before we close the session, we have a few minutes for any questions from the others in the room. Sure. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Ladislaus from Tanzania. I'm uh, IPCC focal point for Tanzania. So I would really like to appreciate for your talk and uh, the information that we uh, got from you. I have two questions. Uh, number one is with regard to what need to be done and how need to be done to ensure the energy transition to raw carbon is 
actionable, is feasible and sustainable for developing countries. Uh, or action on the ground. And then number two is with regards to the nuclear energy. To what extent are the benefits outweigh the risk in terms of the using of nuclear technology? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think I can also address the first one too, because uh, uh, <coughs> I did mention that uh, agency, we're not only for nuclear topic, we also have some capacity for energy planning, because we talk about how we can make sure this uh, transition can be feasible, uh, viable uh, to the low carbon uh, objective. Because we have this energy capacity building, uh, we have a, a set of energy tour from the demand, supply, and also environment, environmental assessment. So we provide this uh, capacity building to the, all our member states, in, including country from the, uh, Africa, to, to let them to uh, strengthen their capacity to, f to develop the uh, form, the, uh, the evidence base of the energy policy and the climate policy. So this is actually an area we haven't amplified much in uh, many areas, but this already reflects in our energy compact in the framework of a high-level dialogue on energy, which is launched by the Secret UN Secretary General. So we can help this one together with other international partners to strengthen the peop, uh, countries, uh, especially in developing countries. Let me to go to the second question about how we can weight the safe and the benefit. For sure, nuclear is very specific sector, as I mentioned. So it can bring the benefit, uh, not lo low carbon energy uh, uh, you know, generation, and also can bring uh, other benefit to the other uh, sectors which need to be decarbonized including district heating, uh, uh, desalination, and also the hydrogen production uh, in, the, in, the in the future. A lot of study now ongoing. And also they can bring a lot of uh, social benefits to, bring, uh, to create the jobs, to create uh, also the economic uh, uh, you know, uh, driving force for the industry infrastructure, all the things uh, nuclear can bring to the, the country. Regarding the sa safety, yes. This the issue has been with the nuclear sector from the very beginning. When people, when the human kind started nu uh, peaceful use of nuclear energy, safety is always on the top. You see the, the development in the past 70 years. The safety has been strengthened. Uh, unfortunately, there are three accidents for sure. That's everybody, when we talk about nuclear, they start to look at this one. But uh, you know, human being is learning from that and uh, improve itself. The whole, as I mentioned, since the Fukushima, a lot of uh, effort has been made, global-wise, the sa uh, safety stress test, and also the safety system has been further strengthened. A lot of issue has been not taken, some issue has not been taken into account, now already integrated in the safety assessment and also safety standard and the requirements, including extreme, external extreme uh, uh, events. Now it also has been taken into account in the design base of the new technology. So currently, all the deployment of the nuclear technology in the past years, all generation three and the plus, they have a much stronger uh, in terms of safety and in terms of the resilience. So for sure, when country to look at a nuclear, safety always on the top as kind of a top priority when a uh, country, uh, uh, you know, vendor to provide and when international organization to provide assistance to the country. So that issue has not been uh, ignored. Thank you. Let's go back to the first question, and I think it was a very, very uh, important question. This one was important too, but this was very specific. So the first question about what should we do, you know, in action terms. Uh, actions, like you said, that are things that are actionable, feasible, and sustainable. Over to you. So I think an incredibly important starting point is to make sure that we're connecting scientists and researchers with policymakers, with utilities, with other practitioners. And not just doing so at the end, say, okay, here are our recommendations, you have to do this, right? People have to understand and believe in the analysis in order to take the most rigorous action. So that means doing joint work, recognizing that not all policymakers, not all utilities are going to have time to sit through science sessions for hours. Um, so it's both finding uh, 
good communication strategies, but also creating forums, um, whether it's communities of practice or like modeling forums where you can bring in the policymakers and other decision makers at discrete points in time to inform, okay, what are the key assumptions we should be using based on this set of issues um, in terms of future development, let's say, or in terms of your choices on your energy systems? And how can we best give you information back? So there's a two-way communication that makes it easier to integrate science into that actual decision making. And then obviously, you know, a similar type of approach on, on understanding new technologies, understanding a range of issues around creating resilient systems. But I think creating that communication piece is really the starting point. Yeah, I might uh, add that, uh, especially for developing country, we really need finance to be mobilized for these countries. I think uh, all, all we said is theoretical if we cannot really work on the ground. And uh, I really hope that through initiatives uh, uh, and like this uh, coalition and other, um, uh, another initiative, we will be able to, to mobilize uh, resources to start work in, uh, in countries like Tanzania and uh, in the Southern Africa, for example, which in this moment are really struggling uh, to even have access to electricity to all the population. Thank you. Uh, I just like to add additional uh, points uh, following uh, to, to this gentleman's question regarding nuclear, because I forgot to mention that in my uh, response. Uh, agency is not an uh, uh, organization uh, promoting nuclear. We are just supporting our member state if they make a decision. That's the first one. Second, we have a very uh, comprehensive uh, um, framework to support our member states when they decide to go nuclear. We have this milestone approach framework which address 19 issues uh, when countries want to go nuclear. We're not saying sh you, you will go. You have to look at uh, what infrastructure you have. In these 19 issues, safety is one of them. Also some other issues like uh, uh, radio waste and also the proliferation, uh, nuclear security, or even your uh, capacity, your human resource capacity is one of the key issues among these 19. So we have a uh, review service to have member states to look at that one to make sure you have your infrastructure prepared before you make your decision to in, in, uh, introduce the nuclear power in your country. Thank you very much. We are just on time. so. We can perhaps close the session so that we can go to the other sessions. Before we close, I'd like to thank uh, our panelists. Jinsun had to run out, but you know, in absentia. Thank you very much, Roberta, Meredith, Jinsun, and Wang Wei. Uh, this was a very interesting discussion, and uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to co-host this with you, Roberta. Thank you very much, and thank you to our audience. You've been listening very intently. Uh, uh, if, there's our, if there's any follow-up questions or interest, please do feel free to reach out to either of us and we can take things forward. Thank you very much.